dressed as they are, come from all over the United States to make deals here in the marketplace of America. Let's make a deal. And now, here's America's top trader, TV's big dealer, Monty Hall. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's get started today by meeting these two gentlemen sitting right next to me. I think he means us. What should we do? Stand up. Stand up. It looks like your names are Pete and Noah. What do you fellows do? We host a math podcast. What's your podcast called? The Math Club. The Math Club sounds wonderful. How would you two like to play Let's Make a Deal? We're ready, Monty. You can see on the stage there are three doors. Now, I can tell you that behind one of those doors is a car, and behind the other two are a pair of goats. I'm going to let you choose any one of the three doors you want. So, which do you want to pick? Well, mathematically, it doesn't matter which one we start with. There's an even chance at this point that the car's behind any one of the three doors. So, we'll take door number one. Door number one. An excellent choice. Now, before we go on, let me show you what was behind one of the doors you didn't choose. Let's take a look behind door number two. Aww, he's so cute. We didn't win him. Don't worry, dude. If we win the car, we can sell it and buy as many goats as you want. Awesome. And a lot of other things, too. So let's try to get that car. Good call. There are two doors left. Door number one, which you chose, and door number three. One is the car, and one is the other goat. Before we open them, I have one final offer for you. We'll, we'll switch. switch. Uh, what? We know this one. Yeah, you're going to ask us if we want to keep our original choice, or if we want to switch to door number three. How do you... It's like one of the most famous mathematical brain teasers in the world. It's even named after you, the Monty Hall problem. And... This puzzle led to the very first math conversation Pete and I ever had together almost 30 years ago. So we're pretty familiar with it. Yep. And statistically speaking, our chances of winning double if we switch to the other door. You hear that, Monty? Double. We'll switch. Always switch. But I haven't even. Always switch. Always switch. Always switch. Oh, Noah, hey, Noah, I'll wake up, switch. switch. Having the Monty Hall dream again? Mm-hmm. And I woke up before I got to play with the goats again. Bummer. But I do know something that might cheer you up. Yeah? What? This is a special episode for us. It's episode number 20. Wow, 20? That's really cool. Yeah, and your dream just gave me an idea. Since the Monty Hall problem was the topic of our very first math conversation ever, I thought we could dive into the history of that puzzle, both the puzzle's history and our history with it. Sounds fun. Great. Why don't you start off by reminding us what the Monty Hall problem is, okay? If memory serves, this problem originally gained popularity in 1990 when Marilyn Voss Savant a columnist with Parade Magazine, received a letter from a reader named Craig F. Whitaker. He posed the question like this. Suppose you're on a game show and you're given the choice of three doors. Behind one door is a car, behind the others, goats. You pick a door, say, number one, and the host, who knows what's behind the doors, opens another door, say, number three, which has a goat. He then says to you, do you want to pick door number two? Is it to your advantage to switch your choice? Well, that's definitely when it gained widespread public attention. But interestingly, that's not the first known mention of this puzzle. The problem was originally published in 1975 when Steve Sylvan wrote a letter to the editor of The American Statistician. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, in his version of the problem, there weren't three doors. There were three boxes labeled A, B, and C. And one of the boxes contained the keys to a 1975 Lincoln Continental. Introducing the 1975 Continentals. Judge any luxury car by our car. The other two boxes were empty. Monty gives the contestant a chance to choose one of the boxes and then afterwards reveals one of the other two boxes to be empty. 
That sounds like essentially the same problem. It does. But in this version, Monty then tells the contestant that since there are only two boxes left, there's now a 50-50 chance that the keys are in the box they chose. And he offers the contestant $1,000 in exchange for their box. The question in the letter was, is Monty correct? Is it just a 50-50 chance now? Oh, I see. That is slightly different from the problem that Marilyn Voss Savant would write about 15 years later. The version that she was asked about adds the option to switch doors or to keep the original door. Right. So instead of being offered $1,000 for their original choice, the contestant is offered the choice to switch to the other remaining door. And is Marilyn's version the one that you first learned about? Yeah, I learned about it from a Usenet group called Psy.Math back in the early 90s. So you dialed up this service on your 14.4 baud modem and said, give me a math problem? Well, it was actually on my computer at work, so it was probably more like 14.5 baud. Uh, yeah, it was during the year that you and I lived with a bunch of our friends down in Goleta. Oh, right. And you were working at that engineering company. Yeah, at a place called Sonatech. So check this out. The other night, I spent some time Googling to see if I could find any of those old Psy.Math posts that I used to read. And guess what? There's a Psy.Math Google group that includes the original Usenet archive. Oh, that's cool. I know, right? And here's a particular post that caught my eye. It's from May 5th, 1994. And this is a quote. A while back, the question of proving the bare category theorem was posted. It's been a while since I've been in a math class, and this is actually my first post to the internet, so I apologize for any idiocy. But I have a proof for this and am wondering if I've totally lost it or if I still deserve to refer to myself as a math major. Here goes. And then it continues on. But what does this have to do with... Wait, did you say... My first post to the internet was that it was me. It was the very first thing I ever posted to the internet, and I found it. I can't believe it was still there. And I even wrote, quote, this is my first post to the internet. <laughs> Dude, no way. That is so cool. Yeah, it is. And also super cringe to read my old posts. But what a crazy trip back in time. So anyway... I used to read through people's posts on Psy.Math. It was like an old school version of Reddit. And that's when I first heard about the Monty Hall problem. Did you find the original post that you read back then? Well, honestly, I can't tell for sure, but it's definitely one of the posts in the archive. If you do a search for Monty Hall, you'll get hits going back to 1989, including a bunch of stuff from 1993 and 1994, which is when I would have found it. And there were plenty of posts about Marilyn Vos Savant, too. I remember that when you first shared the question, I was pretty sure that there was only a 50-50 chance once there were only two doors left. But you calmly and patiently explained that even though it was counterintuitive, the math showed that that wasn't really true. Yeah, when Marilyn did her analysis, she came up with the correct answer, which is that it is definitely in the contestant's best interest to switch doors. Her response to Whitaker's question in her column that week began like this. Yes, you should switch. The first door has a one-third chance of winning, but the second door has a two-thirds chance. And at first, that made absolutely no sense to me. There were only two doors left, and the car was behind one of them. You had to spend some time convincing me that it wasn't a 50-50 chance after one of the doors was opened and taken out of the game. Yeah, you were pretty sure that I was wrong. And you were pretty sure that you were right. You know, after all these years, Noah, you still have about a 50-50 chance of being right about stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it did take a few minutes for sure to convince you, but you did ultimately come around to see how it's in your best interest to switch doors. And you're definitely not the only one that had a hard time initially seeing why it's actually not 50-50. For starters, do you remember our roommate Dave? He fought us for hours about how it makes no difference whether you switch or not, because it's obviously 50-50, <laughs> right? And at that point, I suggested that we break out my old Apple IIe and write a program to repeatedly simulate the problem. 
it seemed like that might be the only way to convince him. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And when we made that simulation and let it run through, I don't know, several thousand rounds of the game, it clearly showed that you have a two-thirds chance of winning if you switch and only a one-third chance of winning if you don't. Yep, but it didn't convince Dave. Nope, it sure didn't. He accused us of writing the program so that it would make us look like we were right, remember? He was like, you guys just wrote it so it would say that. <laughs> there was no convincing him. He insisted that it was 50-50, period, end of story. Right, and that really is a pretty typical response for a lot of people when they hear this problem. When Marilyn Bo Savant wrote her analysis and published it in Parade Magazine, she received a lot of letters about her answer. And most of the people who wrote disagreed with her solution. You could say that since 92% of the letters she received claimed that she was wrong and that the answer was simply 50-50. And a lot of those letters were from math professors who tried to mansplain the solution to her, even though from 1985 to 1989, she held the world record for highest IQ. There is something called mansplaining. Have you heard about this? We know what mansplaining is. Mansplaining is when a man will condescendingly explain something to a woman that she already knows. The culture around mathematics at the time allowed many of these male math professors to feel smugly superior and talk down to her. What kinds of things did people say to her? Well, here's a typical example. One letter said, and this is a quote, you are utterly incorrect about the game show question. And I hope this controversy will call some public attention to the serious national crisis in mathematical education. If you could admit your error, you will have contributed constructively towards the solution of a deplorable situation. How many irate mathematicians are needed to get you to change your mind? And someone else wrote, maybe women look at math problems differently than men. Ooh, I know. Ooh, wow. I'd like to hope that if this happened today, that there wouldn't be so much mansplaining and condescension. You know, I'd like to hope that too, but I'm just not so sure. So how did she eventually win people over and convince them? Well, do you remember what eventually convinced you? Yeah, you showed me the math in different ways. And that's exactly what Marilyn did. One way she explained it was to have people picture a variation in which there are a million doors instead of just three. So Monty has you choose one, and then after you do, he opens not just one door, but 999,998 doors. Go after go after go. 999,998 times. And when he's done, the only two doors that are still closed are your original pick and door number, say, 777,777. Okay. Now, in that case, wouldn't you be pretty certain that Monty didn't open door 777,777 because he couldn't because the car is behind it? Well, either that or it's behind the door that I picked. But... <laughs> I only had a one in a million chance of picking the right door right off the bat. Yeah, it's much more likely that you didn't pick the right door at first. And that's why 777,777 is still closed. That is a very convincing argument. And it's an argument that Marilyn Beauce Sabat used when trying to explain the math behind the three door problem. I'm sure a lot of folks realized she was right when they looked at it that way. You'd think so, right? But no. Not most of them. She kept trying, though, and I think the coolest thing she did was when she invited math classes all over the country to run their own simulations of the game and report their results back to her. And what happened? She received data that overwhelmingly supported her original correct answer. One letter she received from an elementary school teacher in Tampa said, quote, our class with unbridled enthusiasm is proud to announce that our data support your position. Thank you so much for your faith in America's educators to solve this. Oh, that is awesome. As an elementary school teacher, I would have loved to have done this with my class. What a great teachable moment. 
Yeah, totally. And, you know, a few of the original letter writers did write back to tell her that she was right. Now, I didn't see any that actually apologized, though. Just admissions that they'd been wrong. So, At least that's something. But an apology would have been nice. Yeah, but what I really want to say is that I am very, uh, <laughs> You know, there are gracious ways to be correct and gracious ways to be incorrect. Many of the people who wrote to her didn't even try to be gracious. In fact, it seems like many of them went out of their way to be ungracious about it. And I think this is exactly the wrong way to communicate when you think someone has made a mistake. Something I admire about Marilyn is that despite being attacked on all sides, she kept her cool and she continued trying different explanations. Yeah. And I remember doing exactly that when we were trying to convince Dave. One interesting angle that I presented him with went like this. If you originally guessed wrong, switching would make you a winner. And if you originally guessed right, switching would make you a loser. Oh, yeah, I remember you trying to explain it to him that way. How'd the rest of it go? So what are the odds that you originally guessed wrong? Okay, well, there are three doors. So if I pick one of them, there is a two-thirds chance that I guessed wrong. Exactly. Which means there's a two-thirds chance that if you switch, you're going to switch yourself into the right door. On the other hand, if you pick the right door to begin with, which would only happen one-third of the time, switching will lead you to a goat. So that's another way to see that you have a two-thirds chance of winning if you switch and only a one-third chance of winning if you don't. Makes total sense to me, but I don't think Dave was buying it. He wasn't. And that leads me to a question, Pete. Why are so many people's intuition about this problem so wrong? Why do they have such a hard time accepting the math of this problem, which shows that you have a better chance of winning if you switch? I think the answer has something to do with positive thinking. Positive thinking? Yeah, our episode, Positive Thinking. Remember? We talked about conditional probability and the ways it can often lead our intuition the wrong way. Oh, right. Can you remind us what conditional probability is, though? Sure. Let's illustrate it with an example. A lot of us have been thinking about the weather lately. So let's make a weather-related example. First, a question. Is it raining outside where you are? No, not right now. But <laughs> California has gotten a lot of rain over the last few weeks. I know, and I hope our California listeners are all staying safe despite the stormy weather. Okay, so it's not raining now. What do you think the probability is that it will rain at some point today? Well, I guess I'd have to consider a lot of factors, right? Like, is it cloudy outside? If it is, that would make me think it's more likely to rain later than if it's sunny out. And if it's windy, that could also make me more likely to think it's going to rain. Right. And the fact that it's the middle of January and you live in the Northern Hemisphere and so on, right? But to keep it simple, let's just focus on whether or not it's cloudy. You might think, well, the probability of rain today is, say, 30%. But if you look outside and see that the sky is full of dark clouds, you're likely to adjust your thinking. The probability of rain today, given that it's dark and cloudy, is 70%. We say that the probability is conditioned on whether or not it's cloudy. Oh, okay. I think I see how this connects to the Monty Hall problem. When Monty opens a door and shows you a goat, you're getting some new information. It's like looking out the window and seeing that it's cloudy. Exactly. But what's challenging here is exactly what information do we get when Monty opens the door? And how can we quantify that information in a way that helps us decide whether we should switch or not? And I think this is where our intuition often struggles to get it right. Yeah. You know, a few weeks ago, I was talking about this problem with a friend of mine, and he claimed that if Monty were to open one of the doors before the contestant made their original choice, leaving only two doors, that in that case, the contestant would have a 50-50 chance of choosing the door with the car. Okay, sure, that's right. Yeah, so far. But here's where it goes off the rails. He said that changing the order of events doesn't change the ultimate probability. What does that mean? Well, that's what I asked. 
So then he listed the events of the problem. First, Monty shows that there are three doors. Second, the contestant chooses one of them. Third, Monty reveals a door. And fourth, the contestant is offered a chance to switch. Okay. Then he said that you can change the order of those events without changing the probability of winning, because when you're trying to determine the probability of multiple events, you do that by multiplying together the probability of each event. And because of the commutative property, it doesn't matter what order you multiply them in, so it doesn't matter what order the events happen in. Okay, hold on. I'm going to stop you right there. Anyone who's ever worn shoes and socks knows that it definitely matters what order you do things in. You put the shoes on before the socks, and that's not a very good look. Right. His point, though, was that if we take the third event, Monty revealing a door, and move it up so it happens first, and then he gives you a choice to pick, that's clearly a 50-50 choice. Therefore, ergo, doing those same things in a different order must have the same odds. Well, there's a problem with the argument your friend was making. The multiplicative rule, which says that the probability of two events occurring is equal to the product of the individual probabilities, only applies when the events are independent. So, for example, cloudiness and rain are not independent. In fact, that's why we look for clouds when we want to know if rain is likely. These events are related. They are dependent in very real ways. Same with the order in which Monty opens the doors. He opens a door later to show you a goat, but only because you've made a choice and he happens to know where the car is. Right. So to make sure I have this right, the chances of me being right were 100%, and the chances of him being right were 0%. You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? So the chances that we were both right were, let's see, 100 times 0, also 0%. Well, I wasn't there with you guys when you were having this conversation, but it does sound like your friend might have been using the rule incorrectly. Just out of curiosity, was he as adamant about his answer as Dave was back in the day? Oh, at least as much. He was very insistent, and he was very resistant to analyzing the problem in any way other than the way he chose to look at it. And so it was very difficult to convince him that his logic was wrong. You know, it's interesting that even in the face of empirical evidence, we humans can find it really difficult to accept facts that challenge our basic assumptions. Sometimes, not even an Apple IIe program is enough to convince some of us. And speaking of Apple IIe programs, do you still have the Monty Hall simulation we wrote? No. Unfortunately, that Apple IIe simulation has been lost to history, along with that computer. But... That didn't stop us from creating a brand new simulation. We used Scratch, an online coding environment, to create two different versions that listeners might want to play with. The first one plays one round of the game at a time. It lets you choose a door, reveals a goat behind one of the doors you didn't pick, and then asks if you want to switch to the other unopened door or not. You can play through that as many times as you want, and it will keep track of how often you win or lose. That sounds pretty cool. Does it have a mode that works like our original Apple program where it can just repeatedly run simulations of the game? It does. The second version of the simulation doesn't pause to ask you what you want to do. Instead, it assumes the player will always switch and repeatedly run simulations by placing the car behind a random door, having the contestant choose a random door, opening an unpicked door that has a goat, and then switching the contestant's guests to the remaining closed door. If you let the simulation run for a while, you can see that the win percentage eventually settles at just about 66.6%. That's exactly how you and I coded this back in the day. You know, maybe we should send a link to Dave. <laughs> Somehow I don't think he'd find it convincing. If you listen real close, you can already hear him. You guys just wrote it so it would look like you were right. <laughs> we will put that link in our show notes, though, so listeners can check it out for themselves. Hey, I got an idea. Do you think we could also link like a clip from the original show where Monty was in the middle of this whole problem? Actually, we can't. And there's a good reason for that. Back in 2002, Monty Hall did an interview for the Television Academy Foundation, and he spoke a bit about this problem. And you know what's interesting? He said that this situation 
never came up on Let's Make a Deal when he was hosting it. Oh, really? Yeah. The funny part about it is that I don't recall on Let's Make a Deal, once you made your selection and I showed you one of the doors it wasn't, all I did was offer you money. I didn't offer you a chance to then change your door again. He usually offered them money in exchange for the door that they'd chosen, like we saw in the original 1975 framing of the problem. But he never offered contestants a chance to switch doors after one of them had been revealed. So this particular probability problem never actually came up on the show. Only in your recurring dream, then. That's right. And one of these times, I'm going to get to play with that goat. Did you know that you can rent goats to mow your lawn? They do a really good job. Huh. Thanks for the tip. And also, thanks for the episode. This was a really fun trip down memory lane. It was pretty awesome sharing this problem that got us talking about math in the first place. And who would have guessed that 28 years later, we'd have a podcast? What's the probability of us having a podcast, given that we wrote an Apple IIe program to play Let's Make a Deal? See how I did that? It's called Conditional Probability. Oh, and since I'd like to know the probability that Dave will reach out and tell us that we're still wrong, given that we just did this episode, here's how he or anyone else in the math club can get in touch with us. Our Twitter handle is at math club podcast, and our email address is mathclubpodcast at gmail.com. Oh, and also, you can now leave us a voice message by going to our SpeakPipe page speakpipe.com slash math club podcast and we're going to be putting together an episode all about math jokes so we'd love for you to contact us through one of those channels to share your favorite math joke with us you know what would be super cool if listeners used our speakpipe page to share their jokes that way we could hear their actual spoken delivery so if you want to hear your joke on the show in your own voice just let us know that we have your permission at the end of your recording. Wow, Pete, 20 episodes down. Now that we've hit this milestone, I have a question for you. Do you want to stick with the podcast you're already doing, or would you like to switch to one of the other podcasts out there? Well, I know your dream mantra is always switch, but I think in this case, I'm pretty happy right where I am. Me too. After almost 30 years, I still love talking math with you. And you know what? In 30 more years, I'll still love talking about it with you. All right, everybody. We'll catch you next time. 